Um, our next um, talk is entitled Reducing Administrative Burdens and Documentation Requirements. And we're very grateful Harold uh, Paz has agreed uh, to come and uh, speak to this. Um, before I give you his background, I would just remind uh, you that, you know, a lot of the things that we deal with, including things uh, that the payers uh, have put on us, are often the reflection of um, other factors. And, you know, one of the things that I often say to my colleagues is that we have preauthorizations because uh, the clinicians have been irresponsible in how they use medical resources over many, many years. Uh, and rather than manage them more intelligently ourselves, other people have had to come in and impose um, ways to manage them. So uh, no finger pointing, and uh, we're all here to solve uh, problems. Um, Harold is the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for Aetna. He leads the clinical strategy and policy at the intersection of all of Aetna's domestic and global businesses responsible for driving clinical innovation to improve member experience, quality, and cost in all areas of healthcare. And um, I would say that before he went to Edna, he was the chief executive officer for uh, the Penn State Hershey Medical Center and Health System. So he's lived on both sides of the street, uh, which I think is really a critical component to how he thinks about things. Um, so Harold, thank you very much for being here. And, uh, sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for the uh, invitation. Uh, I am delighted to be here, and probably not in my bio, is that early in my career, I, I ran a uh, bone marrow transplant ICU and uh, studied that from a research perspective as well and cared for many patients who unfortunately had the sequelae of pulmonary disease in terms of transplant. Um, I still practice pulmonary medicine at the VA. Um, so what I want to talk about is reducing administrative burdens and documentation requirements. And I want to look at this really from a supply, demand, cost function, but then quickly move on to a focus on quality. So supply, you've already heard now several times, as we all know, uh, clinician burnout, particularly in oncology, has become almost an intractable problem in recent years. Uh, and the numbers reveal why, right? So according to the American Society for Clinical Oncology, we're facing a significant shortage of medical gynecologic oncologists and other subspecialty areas as well in the US by 2020. And it's no secret that with a rapidly aging population, increasing numbers of cancer survivors due to the tremendous success of biomedical research and care delivery, and almost flat growth in the number of oncologists, all of this contributes to the problem on the su supply side. On the demand side, <clears throat> cancer treatment continues to grow in complexity uh, while the cost of care is increasing significantly. More than 1.7 million new cancer cases with 40 plus indications were expected to be diagnosed in 2018. And therapies are becoming more and more targeted with genetic testing and precision medicine contributing to a segmentation of patient populations. Cost. So the cost of care continues to rise, shall we say, exponentially. According to the National Center for Biotechnology Information, most cancer drugs launched between the years 2009 and 2014 were priced at more than $100,000 per patient for one year of treatment. And more recently, we've seen launch prices of more than $400,000 per year of treatment. And every indication is that's a trend we're going to continue to see more and more of. So as was alluded to, although insurers are merely viewed as gatekeepers to contain and reduce medical costs, what I'd like to do today is talk about our additional role in promoting and delivery of evidence-based, high-quality clinical care. And I'd like to start from Aetna's perspective, and I recognize that there are many, many payers, insurers, both private as well as public. But I'd like to talk specifically about our philosophy about the use of clinical policy as a driver for quality and safety. And I'll share the work that we're doing to reduce the administrative burdens associated with cancer-related tests, procedures, medications, and biologics. 
And what I'd like to then go on and do is discuss our work with the Core Quality Measures Collaborative to reduce the burdens of duplicative quality measure in the US. So first, let's talk about clinical policy as a driver of quality. As an enterprise, Aetna utilizes evidence-based clinical policies and pre-authorization processes to ensure that our members receive appropriate quality care. This process is guided by our clinical policy bulletins that provide a transparent and scientifically grounded framework for coverage. The team at Aetna that does this work, made up of physicians and those that compile all the clinical trials literature, as well as consensus statements from nationally recognized uh, clinical organizations, report to me at the company. And we have an enormous investment in getting these right. And I'm very proud of the fact that long before I left academic medicine and joined Aetna about four and a half years ago, this group was really regarded as the gold standard in the industry. They do tremendous work. They're very thorough and thoughtful about how they develop these clinical policy bulletins. And we're pleased to see that many others uh, have looked at them as well. By design, health benefits cover services and treatments that are considered medically necessary and deliberately exclude those services that are considered experimental, investigational, or unproven. And by only covering those procedures and products backed by robust clinical studies that demonstrate meaningful efficacy and safety, health plans can promote the delivery of quality care as well as reduce exposing patients to iatrogenic harm. In addition, Aetna's clinical policy development process uses a multidisciplinary team of physicians, clinicians, and researcher reviews available and it makes use of professional guidelines as well as clinical research and expert opinions. This approach ensures that policies reflect the most recent and robust evidence available in the literature. So let me give you an example of this. That's the work um, uh, that has been done for the breast cancer drug Herceptin. And although it's been shown to be effective in certain tumors that overexpress HER2 new protein, it hasn't been shown to be effective in cancers without this protein overexpression. So because of this, health insurers like Aetna have limited coverage of Herceptin to certain ca cancers where HER2 new, uh, HER2, uh, new uh, overexpression occurs. The coverage limitation ensures that the drug is used in cancers where there's proven effectiveness. Where Herceptin is used in cancers without the expression of HER2 new overexpression, the patient potentially could be exposed to toxicity of the drug without any compensation benefit uh, in terms of tumor control. That approach is used over and over again in thinking through various types of modalities around therapy. So let me move on now to talk about pre-authorization and removing friction uh, in general. At Aetna, we understand that the pre-certification process can feel like an undue burden for many providers. And certainly, I've personally had the opportunity in the past four years or so to interact with uh, physicians and, and other clinicians uh, around these kinds of questions. I think it's important to understand that prior authorization serves to verify that certain services, such as advanced imaging, specialized laboratory tests, and we are seeing more of this now with around genetic testing, genomics, and surgical procedures are medically necessary and uh, appropriate for our members. We do consider comparative cost of uh, equally effective agents, but we do not do a formal cost-effectiveness analysis or apply any cost-effectiveness cost threshold for coverage. And I think that's important. The physicians at our company, the others that are involved in this process, look at this from a clinical perspective as opposed to the cost perspective, which, frankly, we leave to others. Preauthorization also provides a determination in advance that an intervention will be covered. And without this process, the provider may be left unpaid for a service if it was denied in a retrospective review. Mandatory preauthorization affords the provider all the rights of appeal and protections under the law, under regulations, and accreditation requirements afforded to the utilization management determination process including independent physicians selected 
by external review organizations at the final uh, level of appeal on behalf of a member. So typically what will happen is, is that there could be a, a decision uh, not to cover, for example, a, a certain procedure or treatment. There's the right or the opportunity for an appeal uh, by the physician or by the member. And by the time we get to the third level, it would go out to an independent external review process to make sure that we got it right internally. But in doing so, what we can do is we can make sure that the same protections, such as these appeal rights, are available to those who go through the process. That is not available in, in when there is a voluntary predetermination. And I think that's important because we certainly have to operate within the regs and requirements of the various states in which uh, we do business and certainly want to make sure that we have a formal process that's fair and equitable. Health plans also vary, uh, are, are very selective uh, regarding the items and services that require uh, pre-certification. And um, we, like others, invest significant resources in conducting these clinical reviews. It's important uh, to note, though, that a vast majority of the items and services that are, are being offered to members do not require pre-certification. At Aetna, medications, procedures, and tests that deviate uh, from the evidence are placed on a pre-certification list. That's how they got there in the first place. So for example, newer agents or classes of drugs such as the pdl one inhibitors often require pre-authorization as a new indication for these agents and appropriate usage as it continues to evolve. Specifically, granulocyte colony stimulating factors, erythropoiesis stimulating agents, CAR T therapies, and targeted cancer therapeutics are on these pre certification lists. These are new and evolving therapies for which uh, there is a great deal that is uh, yet to be understood, and uh, the, the appreciation of what is appropriate ther therapy continues to evolve. And Aetna, much like other payers, uh, complies with federal and state regulations pertaining to services that require prior authorization and uses of advanced analytics uh, and a comprehensive review of the clinical literature um, um, in terms of pre-certification. These pre-certification uh, lists are, uh, are updated regularly as the clinical evidence evolved. And all of the uh, clinical policy bulletins are reviewed annually against the new data that, uh, that is uh, available uh, and helps guide what is uh, considered to be appropriate coverage of uh, therapy. Though understanding all of that, we also know and we recognize that this process can be time consuming and quite resource intensive for providers. And that's why we've undertaken uh, a continuous improvement process to ensure that pre-certification is as simple and as effective as possible. So one, for example, we're partnering with and educating our provider networks uh, to use evidence-based guidelines when making requests for services that require prior authorization. This supports the facilitation of safe delivery of care with an emphasis on the reduction of administrative burdens for the providers. Second, uh, to make sure that our decision-making process is as transparent as possible, we're focusing on the timely and clear uh, uh, communication with both uh, members, our members, and with their physicians and other clinicians. As such, Aetna adheres to and often exceeds the National Committee for Quality Assurance Standards for decision timeliness. Third, to ensure that there is continuity of care for our members transitioning between place of service and providers, we, cl uh, we collaborate closely with our member providers to identify required services and process authorizations to avoid those gaps. And in addition, to increase efficiency, Aetna is committed to accelerating adoption of electronic submissions by making prior authorization requirements and other other formulary information electronically accessible to providers given all the challenges that we've heard about this morning uh, with the use of EHRs. And we also support national standards for electronic clinical documentation exchange and promote live EHR interactions when obtaining prior authorization. And again, this we think is important to facilitate the use of uh, electronic uh, uh, records in care delivery. 
We ensure that to make the right decisions on coverage, our medical directors consult with hematologists and oncologists on case determinations. Um, a review of an independent match specialist selected by an independent external review organization is available at the final level of member appeal. And then finally, we're developing a test and learn environment in which care management teams engage with providers and members to understand the care plan, to get authorizations in place appropriately throughout the course of the treatment for colorectal, for prostate, and GI patients. This pilot program will roll out in mid-2019. Uh, let me move on and talk just briefly about mitigation strategies uh, for administrative burden uh, uh, re related to quality management. Um, as caregivers, we all know that documentation and medical record review related to quality management requires a significant amount of provider time and resources. Uh, a recent study in, in uh, health affairs found that annually, physician practices in four common specialty areas spend on average 785 hours per physician and more than $15.4 billion dealing with reporting of quality measures. According to a report uh, uh, by the National, Academies of Medicine, National Academy of Medicine um, uh, called Vital Signs, Core Metrics for Health and Healthcare Progress, current quality improvement efforts uh, feature too many measures and, and many measures that are imperfect, quote unquote, and uncoordinated. The report suggests starting with priority needs of healthcare systems and recommends a core set of measures that could be used to assess progress towards meeting those needs. Clearly, and I think without a doubt, quality measures are critical to ensuring safe and effective patient care. But the current system costs too much in terms of human and financial capital. We need greater effort across our federal agencies and healthcare system to standardize me measures and make them easier to report. And so to achieve that, we need to do uh, the two following things. First, we have to reduce the variability of measure specif specifications by different payers, both commercial as well as CMS. Currently, different health plans may have the same goal measure, but actually implementing these measures differently or they use different criteria. And that results in providing different guidance to physician practices. Second, it's imperative that we select uh, agreed upon quality measures across the board that would reduce the burden on practices to evaluate and execute quality improvement. The uh, core quality measures collaborative, CQMC, is working to do just that, focusing on reducing uh, the number of measures and the variation among similar measures. In this initiative, core measure sets agreed upon across health plans, provider groups, business groups, the American Medical Association, and uh, CMS and other organizations. This multi-stakeholder voluntary effort was created to promote measure alignment and harmonization across public and private payers. The collaboration aims to add focus to quality improvement efforts, reduce the reporting burden for providers, and offer consumers actionable information to help them make the decisions about where they receive their care. Aetna is a member of the CQMC and has representation on as steering committee. Let me just wrap up with the three main um, uh, goals or aims of the CQMC. First, to recognize high value, high impact evidence-based measures that promote better patient health outcomes and to provide useful information for improvement, decision-making, and payment. Second, to reduce the burden of measurement and volume of measures by eliminating low value metrics redundancies and inconsistencies in measure specification and quality measure reporting uh, across payers. And third, finally, to refine, align, harmonize measures across payers to achieve congruence in the measures being used for payment and other accountability purposes. The CQMC has developed and released a core set of quality measures in key clinical areas such as primary care, cardiology, orthopedics, oncology, and OBGYN that we believe should be implemented across both commercial and governmental payers. So reducing administrative burden uh, through uh, electronic, uh, standardized electronic measures, and I want to wrap up on this point. So finally, we believe that standardized electronic quality measures incorporated into electronic medical records 
and operating in the background is a critical component to reducing administrative burden on oncologists as well as other specialists, other medical professionals and clinicians in general. Currently, most quality improvement measures are assessed through claims. But what you can measure through claims, quite frankly, is quite limited, especially in oncology. More information can be found in the patient electronic medical record. And unfortunately, though, some, pa some physicians are still using paper records, which insurers like Aetna have absolutely no access to. In addition, practices with EMRs often have interoperability issues that we're all familiar with with payer systems. So the opportunity to move away from looking at claims data to clinical data is fraught with those two significant challenges of, unfortunately, many, many uh, providers still using paper, but it's the interoperability issue across the board that's been referenced in some of the earlier presentations that we struggle with. We believe there are solutions over the horizon, though. So for example, access uh, for payers and other uh, measurement entities to electronic medical records should be increased. And achieving this will require some IT solutions, including interoperability standards and standard interfaces, such as APIs, um, standardization of data elements, and the ability to protect member information and confidentiality by limiting access to just payer uh, and other measuring entities. Uh, we're looking at uh, some interesting initiatives, and as was announced a couple of days ago, we're part of a consortium looking at blockchain solutions as a way to achieve uh, opportunities for interoperability. So finally, at Aetna, uh, we're working hard to reduce the administrative and documentation um, uh, burdens in place for our providers as we strive towards achieving high quality, efficient, and effective patient care. There's certainly a lot more work. There's a great deal of work uh, to do to get to a more sustainable model. And it's going to take collaboration across the entire healthcare system and get all parties involved. But we certainly believe it's an achievable goal. Thank you.